Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to JS Interactive. This is a follow-up to this JavaScript, which just broadcasted about a month ago. We have our awesome panelists, and one of our moderators um, would like to introduce to us, also known as Ember Sherpa in some circles. Um, Tara, you can follow Taras at Taras M on Twitter. He's also a CTO of this dot. And introducing Sean, also known as the Lark in on Twitter. Really like your your little thing. What do they even call those? That's cute. <laughs> I, I don't think that's why introductions work, right? Hi. Bye bye. Oh, hey. <laughs> Hello. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> John, do you so, want to give us like, an intro? Like an intro about me? Yeah. Okay. Ten, yeah. Ten. My name is Sean Larkin, and I'm one of the maintainers for Webpack. Uh, but I'm also big on the open source sustainability, especially uh, in the JavaScript scene. So, um, yeah. Uh, I'm right now here at, in Seattle at Microsoft Build at the Washington State Convention Center. So if you're here, you can come find me. Cool. Very cool. I want to see some people photobombing after that. <laughs> okay. now, now introducing Potch. Potch uh, works at Mozilla. You can find him on Twitter at Potch. Potch, do you want to give a quick intro? Yeah, hey. Um, it was real fun to do the previous live cast, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions today. And I'm just looking forward to uh, another fun discussion. I think uh, I'm in my uh, home in Mountain View, California. Um, and I, well, I don't think any uh, conference attendees are going to photobomb me. A couple cats might. So uh, just be on the lookout. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and also introducing Sashko from the Apollo GraphQL project. Sashko, uh, you can follow him at Stu Bilo on Twitter. Sashko, you want to give an intro? Yeah. So I uh, lead the team working on some open source tools under the Apollo name uh, for GraphQL. And I'm here uh, trying to represent the GraphQL community and uh, getting in this discussion with browsers. Very cool. And then we have. Nolan from the Microsoft Edge team. You can follow him at Nolan Watson, also known for your amazing new Twitter, Reddit, Facebook project. <laughs> yeah. It's called Mastodon. It's, uh, it's an open source Twitter alternative. I didn't make it, but I, I run an instance. Um, cool. But yeah, happy to be here. Had a lot of fun last time. Uh, very interested to hear the Q&A today. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. And then we have Brendan Ike, who co-founded uh, Brave and JavaScript. So, Brendan, do you want to go ahead and get him to introduce yourself? Hi. Uh, I just did JavaScript, um, Mozilla, Firefox, Brave. Still doing stuff. <laughs> the passion never ends. You can follow Brendan at Brendan Ike on Twitter. Um, and Addy, Addy Osmani, who is on the Chrome team. Hey, folks. Uh, I work on Chrome. I lead one of the teams uh, running web developer relations over here. Uh, care about the web, want the web to win. Go team. <laughs> Very yep. cool. So this, uh, this session is, is uh, we have a few questions prepared based on the state ofs that you guys gave last time. And audience, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Please remember. Remember, we do have a code of conduct, so be nice to each other. Um, and with that, I'll let Taras go ahead and start with the questions. Awesome. Thank you, Tracy. All right. So I just want to do a little introduction to the questions uh, before uh, we jump into them. Um, the big purpose of, of, of having these conversations is to allow people that are uh, creating applications uh, and creating the, um, the things that people use on the web, um, giving these people an opportunity to ask questions and also hear the conversations that, that and participate in the conversations that happen amongst the people that make the web platform. Uh, so here um, on, uh, on our panel today, we have representatives of the, of, uh, the top browsers um, and uh, people that make the tools and the, the, the um, technologies that we use to build our applications. So um, with that introduction, I'm going to go into our first question. The first question is, uh, what uh, recently released APIs uh, do you think will make the most impact on uh, people that create applications today? Man, service worker is huge. The service worker APIs, um, 
that's been turning web performance around like on its head and making it really easy for people is like something that we're really passionate about at Webpack um, and our plugin ecosystem. But you know, from a tooling standpoint, we're super excited for things like link rel preload um, as well as service workers. I'm really excited about ES modules starting to land in browsers. Um, and a lot of browsers are actually behind flags at the moment between like script type equals module um, and dynamic import. I think we're eventually going to get to this point where hopefully folks don't have to bundle as much their applications. Um, it also opens up lots of interesting opportunities for us to load code more granularly and more intelligently. Um, it's probably going to take a little bit of a while before people are just, you know, deploying ES modules to production. But I think I think now is an exciting time. I've been waiting a few years for this to happen. I'm pretty jazzed about uh, the Web Payments API. Actually, um, I think uh, Web Payment and Web Payment Request um, are actually a huge key to sustainability on the web. Um, you know, a lot of people want to give you money. Um, you, you go look at, you know. You go look at parking meters in cities where they take credit cards and have an app and where they just still take quarters. And it wasn't that people didn't want to pay for parking. It's that it was hard and it was a pain in the butt. And I feel like we're still in the era of quarters on the web. Um, and I know, uh, you know folks like Brendan with, their, with the payments and payments at Brave are another piece of that. But this is making it so easy for people to go from I want to give you money or I could give you money to I did give you money, I think is going to be really transformative. Um, and I think payments request is sort of a big piece of sustainability on the web. Um, and I'm really excited to see that roll out into more browsers in the next couple of years. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm excited about all those APIs too, service worker, modules, payments. Ah, the web is amazing. Um, but I'm, I'm also really excited about uh, shared array buffers. That's one that's kind of uh, flying under the radar that I think could be a huge game changer. Like concurrency is basically a given on the mobile uh, for mobile apps, like native mobile apps. You know, it's just it's a, it's a given that you're going to try to um, do as much concurrency as possible. But on the web, it's it's historically been kind of difficult because web workers exist; they're well supported, but uh, the APIs are kind of people find them kind of cumbersome. Um, so shared array buffers, this idea of having this shared piece of memory, like bringing you know true the like, or more or more uh, more powerful concurrency tools to the web, I think is I mean. You can build frameworks out of that, I think, that you know we can't even imagine right now. So I'm really excited about that one. Even on top of shared array buffers makes me think of WebAssembly, which I'm so excited for. I mean, what Firefox is shipping it right now, and Chrome with flags, or it's getting really close. Um, that, that's going to be a huge step you know, for frameworks and toolings. And uh, you know, it's going to be really exciting. Yeah, I think uh, the thing that I'm most excited about, which is a bit of a different thing, is um, things that enable a better developer experience. Um, like, there's all these improvements recently, like in the in the edge, like chakra debugging, um, because people are using more and more tools or different ways to do stuff, and uh, some of those make it harder to see what you're working on in the browser. But being able to look at your source code in the browser and debug that and see what's going on is like one of the best things about the web platform for me. Um, so uh, on topic of uh, WebAssembly there, we, uh, uh, Sean brought it up. The, so I'm curious, what, what do you think is going to be kind of the first killer app for WebAssembly that's going to really kind of show its strength? Games. <laughs> games? It will be games, for sure. Uh, either that or it's going to be um, toolings or libraries that allow you to do heavy computations and separate threads, things that maybe weren't possible before in the past that we can now bring that business logic, you know, to the front end in a in a binary format. I, I'd expect some serious productivity apps to start showing up. Stuff people have already started building um, things beyond games in Unity, um, for example, and being able to compile those more serious applications to the web, um, and sort of have that blended UI where it's not just a big canvas, but it's DOM for controls, but having access to powerful uh, computation, potentially even parallel computation, is going to be pretty huge. And I'd expect some um, some productivity apps around um, e even more hardcore things like um, sort of CAD and um, drawing and vector graphics and things like that. Um, but I think we're going to see in browsers sort of as that first step into um, 
first step from just pure games into things that are a little bit more around building. I think augmented reality and like live video augmentation, yes. uh, allowing people to put Sean's beautiful hair on them. Just like it, I think things like that are just going to be so. Okay. Thank you for the demo, Sean. Yep, you're welcome. I had a question, um, Sean. I know that you, I, I, at least I heard that there are some plans for, for Webpack to really be starting to support WebAssembly or WebAssembly compiling. Yes. Yeah, so actually it's funny you mentioned that because right now in about 45 minutes, the Moss grant board is going to review our, our final application um, for making WebAssembly a first class citizen. So if this does get approved, we, we'll get some funds that will kind of support our endeavor to be able to basically allow for, you know, um, in a normal developer using Webpack terms, they would kind of understand it as being able to just take any C++ or Rust file and import it into JavaScript and have it work just like a JavaScript module. But behind the scenes, We'll take, a, we'll take care of making sure that it functions uh, and is sharing the same memory heap um, and is using the correct WebAssembly wrappers, et cetera, and using the APIs appropriately. That way, developers can use it with ease, um, and it puts it in the hands of so many more people. It sounds like, so that, that sounds like it'll be um, huge uh, for, for the actual, be able to, for the adoption of, um, WebAssembly, uh, one of the things that I'm hearing is that uh, we are going to see uh, new things possible, right? Because we, the kind of applications that, uh, like games at the level that would be possible once you run them in WebAssembly, uh, we ha haven't seen really being like broadly used, right? We, we, we can run Quake in the, in the browser, but, we, but we're not installing Quake on people's machines by giving them a URL, right? Um, so, uh, so, and uh, kind of what we've seen to date is uh, kind of web frameworks, usually places where we see this kind of experimentation um, around new technologies. Um, what, um, are you aware of any, um, any uh, frameworks or tools that, that, um, that are coming out that are using or uh, experimenting with these new APIs that uh, people might be interested in checking out? So I don't know any libraries myself, but I can just think of ideas off the top of my head where it might be beneficial, like uh, like the folks at A-Frame, you know, doing the, like what Addy said, the augmented reality or mixed reality, um, and, and kind of leveraging that. Um, anybody who's wanting to do graphics processing or uh, you know, is going to be a candidate to want to try and use this, um, or just even like number crunching, uh, or algorithmic processes, maybe machine learning. Those are things that, you know, we can't really do too heavily on the web, but you can dump it into a separate thread um, and have concurrency functionality, a little bit lower level access, and, and having it execute in a binary format, you're going to see uh, a lot more improvements and many more things possible. I think um, I've had a lot of, oh. go ahead, go ahead, sorry. I was gonna say, I think one other opportunity that people don't really think about too much is for data loading. Um, so a lot of today's apps are doing like, loading up a ton of data into the client and doing a lot of processing on that. And especially, you know, the stuff what we're working on is like pretty much generic frameworks to do that um, for any app. And so we can implement the hard part and put that into WebAssembly and manage our own memory and stuff like that. And then users can just have super fast data loading and processing without having to worry about it. So uh, that's one often overlooked thing. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm one of the contributors to PouchDB, and so when I look at something like like Wasm, it definitely makes me think to uh, think think of databases and the opportunities there. Like, um, I mean, I think back to mscript and the kind of stuff that people have wanted to do with that. You know, w one of the first things we saw was people taking SQLite. And uh, compiling that down, right? Because like they wanted, they just wanted access to SQLite in the browser. Um, I think that something like that becomes a lot more feasible when you have Wasm, or you could even do uh, interesting things like uh, why not just take the query engine uh, inside of SQLite and compile just that part down, and then maybe you know put it on top of uh, IndexedDB or Service Worker Cache or something. Um, and then you have like this query engine that represents you know SQL, a language that people are really familiar with, and you have the the battle-tested code of SQLite. 
uh, running as well. I, th I think there's going to be really interesting stuff popping up. Um, I mean, that that's just one of the <laughs> you know many like bonkers <laughs> applications for this kind of technology. We had a question from uh, Ben, who's in the audience. He said, well, WebAssembly does not completely support all of the types of thread memory interaction that are required for modern gaming there, right? <laughs> I, would, I would say, first off, it currently supports none of them. Um, so <laughs> we have a while to go. Um, but I, And obviously, I don't think it may su ever support every type of thread interaction that you would require. Um, I just um, I just don't expect the web to necessarily replace every piece of the native platform in that regard. But there's going to be big pieces that obviously, as we found a balance between security, performance, stability, and um, capability for developers, obviously as many of those interaction types as possible, um, we're going to enable. But um, yeah, shared array buffer is a good start, but it's by no means, you know, full threading experience that a developer expects on the web. So, am I muted? <laughs> um, nope, you're good. I good. Uh, so, Shared Array Buffer comes with Atomics, which do a fairly complete set of what you need for things like uh, Unity and, and Epic's Unreal Engine. Uh, we're not talking hardware-specific, um, you know, store order dependent um, memory fences and things like that because those aren't portable and it turns out um, I don't think you need them. I think the, the portable sort of intersection is what's in, in the shared array buffer proposal and it looks like it's enough to do, I mean we've been working across four companies with people including some who are now, I'm glad Vukicevic uh, has gone to Unity from Mozilla or is going to Unity. Um, I think we don't need every last, you know, hardware specific instruction. I think the atomics part of the shared array buffer proposal gives you, you know, compare and swap and and memory fences and and before using all your cores and once or using all your your hyper threads on your cores and once you do that. You know, there are other things to, to worry about, like SIMD, which kind of stalled in, in JavaScript, but is, is supposed to be coming into WebAssembly. It's on the roadmap. It'll take some time to get SIMD there. Once you use all your cores and all your short vector units, your SIMD units, then I think the next thing to do is upgrade the GPU. And, and that's, I think that's going to happen. WebGL 2 is out now, but it's just OpenGL ES 3.2 or something. And there's so much more in desktop, you know, OpenGL 4 plus. There's stuff coming from the Kronos group like Vulkan. So I'm, I'm a maximalist on, on getting these things exposed to the web safely. Um, you know, my, my vision isn't just SQLite <laughs> cross-compiled. Alon Sakai showed that at, at JSConf BU in 2011, and people were blown away by the performance just running in, in a JavaScript engine the other day. Um, once you have SQLite, you need a database administrator. Nobody wants that. Um, what I think we should be aiming for is, is things people do, crazy people do, like Andre Karpathy does convolutional neural nets, recurrent neural nets in JavaScript. Um, I met somebody the other day who has um, web accelerometer-based uh, machine learning that can tell whether you're doing, you know, Karate Kid wax on or wax off, um, can tell whether you're jogging or walking. Um, this stuff will only get better with WebAssembly. And if we get into the GPU fully, um, you know, we can have rust on the GPU. So I'll just stop there, rust on the GPU. Cool, so um, unless anyone, anyone else has something to say, I just wanted to quick point out that um, two other great examples of uh, WebAssembly or AsmJS, which is becoming WebAssembly, that are already out there are um, the Pico 8 uh, virtual browser. If anyone's ever played Pico 8 games, uh, that's actually a compiled engine that's been uh, transpiled to the web. Right now it's ASM.js, but they want to move to WebAssembly. And also um, archive.org, all their Mac emulation and old DOS game emulation. Mm -hmm. All that stuff is WebAssembly. Um, it's just a great example of taking old platforms and just running the whole thing on the web. Um, so in terms of archival and preservation work, I think actually there's a lot of cool stuff um, coming because of WebAssembly. So I just wanted to make sure people knew that those things were powered by that. So how do we, how would we know, uh, like where, 
is the idea that we're going to be able to run every the, every application that that would run natively you would then run deliver it over the browser instead or like how do we know where the line is between what we want uh, to do with WebAssembly versus what should stay native? I think so there, there, I'll say something. Uh, there, there's a gap that has to do with the the store based app install model where apps and stores are bundled with permissions and they you know you kind of you want the app so you say yes you know yes uber can have my location um, path can have my contacts right um, this hasn't always worked out well but that's not really the web model the web model is is sort of weaving the permission grant into the interaction design elevate privilege from startup onward and and there's still a gap there people complain about this they say I need I, besides really fast, you know, custom scrolling and, and animation, things that people claim only native can do, which isn't really true, uh, you know, it's always kind of temporarily true, there's, there, there's a gap in the permission model, and it's really two-edged. I think the web is safer by design, and if we can keep the sort of authority that apps have minimized and, and make it possible for users to grant special power only when they're needed, I think we'll have a safer, more secure web. But that definitely um, sometimes is used against the web. And, and that's the reason some people do native apps, for sure. Um, so I think um, from, from really uh, modern technologies, I, I want to jump into something that's really a topic, talking about two technologies that are you know we use every day, but uh, it's a, it seems to be a hot topic these days. Is, so I'm curious what your thoughts are about uh, uh, you know, using CSS or, or using CSS through JavaScript or in JavaScript. I think this is one of those fun, contentious topics. Um, so I think CSS and JS, um, for many people, brings an, a, a certain amount of DX value to it. Um, at the same time, some solutions, uh, without calling anybody out, um, some solutions end up you know, uh, basically uh, embedding CSS directly inside JavaScript in your final bundles, which can lead to a double cost um, of parse, because you first of all have to parse the JavaScript, then you have to parse the CSS, increases in memory usage, um, sort of damages to the amount of cacheability that you have in place as well. Now, that's not to say that CSS and JS is, you know, the worst thing ever. It definitely isn't. Um, Sean could probably say, you know, in Webpack, you could use things like, you know, the extract text plugin and things like that to just make sure that you've got um, actual CSS generated at the very end of your build process. But I think that the onus is on tooling authors to sort of steer people in the right direction um, there and make sure that you're, um, you're giving people the right calls for web performance out of the box, you know, in a way that's relatively low friction to them. Because they're going to, in most cases, just, you know, they're going to copy paste whatever example you've got in your docs and say, okay, well, you know, I trust you. You've, you've got this popular open source project. I'm sure you're doing the right thing for me. And that's not always the case today. And I, one of the, my other concerns about sort of the CSS and JS is actually a separation um, it's a separation of concerns, but not just for the pure programming reason. Um, on a lot of large, healthy teams, there are going to be people who are CSS experts. There are going to be people who really, really know CSS, and people who really, really know JS. Um, and one of the benefits of having CSS live in the files it lives in, or at least be packaged alongside as opposed to integrated throughout, is if someone needs to update the visual appearance of uh, a component, um, that person does not necessarily have to know JavaScript. Um, and know your build tool chain. Um, at larger and larger teams where that separation of concerns is out there, um, either you, right now you're going to have to either take the person who updated the component CSS that they built out and then reintegrate it into the JS. And if you had to make tweaks, export it to some static CSS file where, and have this weird multiple maintenance file path, or we can just use CSS files. CSS files are a great way to store that. You can use tag template strings, obviously. There's all kinds of hacks around this. But you know, right now, we're kind of moving to this nexus where if you want to work on any part of an application, whether that be the strings um, that you, for translation, or the style, or the visuals, or now they're, that's now SVG. It's all in a JavaScript file. And we're creating this like one human being, this one type of human being. And it's great, because it's great for the ergonomics of developers who know JavaScript. But I think it punishes 
a team of people with diverse skill sets where you know the person who with, knows JS is like, ah, oh, CSS is weird and terrible, but there are people who know CSS and are good at it. It's a different programming language. It has different constraints. Um, and by letting it stand alone, there are a lot of benefits you can gain around workflow and contribution. Yeah, so I, I, I generally agree with, with what was just said, except I would add on to what, uh, what, what Poch said uh, to say that, uh, I mean, there are different skill sets in every kind of team. And if your team is like purely, like everyone is comfortable with JavaScript or even just like they're comfortable learning like how to represent their CSS as JSON, which is like, it's not a big stretch, you know, to go from CSS to JSON. Um, then it's not such a big deal. But I, I definitely side with Adi uh, in pointing out that uh, I think that CSS and JS right now is almost purely the the purpose is almost purely for developer convenience, and that's a great thing. Um, but it's worth recognizing what the user costs are. So I, I think you get two main uh, DX developer experience benefits from it. You get uh, the hot module replacement, right? It's just JavaScript, and so when you run in dev mode, the CSS can kind of replace itself as you're editing it. That's pretty cool. Um, and then also it's part of this asset graph. Uh, that Webpack maintains, uh, so that you like you know like this uh, this JSX file depends on this CSS file, which depends on this um, image or whatever. Um, but where that where that gets tricky is is yeah, as, as Adi said, you really have to make sure that you're using something like the Extract Text plugin. Uh, you have to make sure that at the end of the day, you are actually just building true uh, CSS because this could be this can be very subtle uh, how bad of a performance impact they can have. It's not just things like double parsing. It's things like, I mean, you, you look at how this asset graph works by default. You're not adding these kind of plugins. And you're not you know, keeping track of what the actual build target is. And you could make it so that you know, all of your images are just data URIs by default, which is actually uh, a, a lot of browsers are not optimized for that. Actually, I just found out in our engine uh, a little while ago that uh, we parse data URIs on the main thread. So like if you were going to include gigantic images in there and you're parsing that on the main thread, you know that's uh, it's not going to be so great because browsers have been optimizing for like the classic web for a long time, right? Where your images are separate and your CSS is separate and your HTML is separate, and browsers are extremely good at that. And when your CSS is separate, it can parse it once instead of twice, and you know, but like no matter how much we optimize it, it's always going to be faster. And then also these patterns are not necessarily something that we've seen on the web until very recently, and so they might not be optimized in in engines. So um, I, I would, I would not want to throw away the benefits of having that asset graph because I think that's really cool. Like you don't run into this problem where your CSS never stops growing because you don't know what you can safely remove and not. Right, that's really awesome. But I would definitely want to balance that with like a smart build system that makes sure that it actually extracts it out and it's not just a gigantic JavaScript bundle at the end. Yeah, and we give people the benefit of the doubt of maybe knowing what they should do and what they shouldn't do. Like what's tough for us is that. We can give people these tools, and I think maybe this falls on our responsibility to educate a bit more on what you should be doing or what the ramifications of shipping, you know, CSS in JS in production versus extracting it out. Um, but you know, long story short, it's like you know we have to stay as unopinionated as possible. So if there are people who have found like really great techniques where if you ship just a tiny amount of CSS in JS, you can treat that, you know. It essentially render blocks, but you can force it as your critical CSS. So if you do just a tiny amount, but then you extract the rest of it, you get kind of a really great, um, you know, you get some good performance benefits out of it, uh, at least from what I understand. But yeah, in the end, I think you know the education is is really key in teaching developers what should you be doing or understand the ramifications of, you know, loading a ginormous huge bundle or shipping a super large image inside of JavaScript as a data URI versus maybe one that's like 5 or 6K. Um, you know, it's really interesting that these features exist to balance out, you know, the cost of a network request and waiting on that waterfall, um, especially since a lot of people are still switching over to H2, uh, you know, as a network um, for their servers. Cool. cool. We had a few. Um, we have a. We had a few questions on. Uh, on the chat, so, let me see. There are quite a few, and um, let, you know, there's still a few questions on the WebAssembly. One question was, how would performance be effective when a lot of files are loaded through script type module? Sorry for backtracking a little bit, but I want to make sure these get answered. Effective when a lot of files. 
So I think that browsers up until this point have generally been trying to optimize for you know, the granularity and number of files that the average web experience tries to ship down. Um, but at least I can only speak for Chrome. I think that we still have an, an amount of work to do um, to optimize for these, these hyper granular experiences that are going to start getting shipped down more and more as modules start getting adopted. Um, there are a number of interesting problems to solve there, like uh, interprocess communication costs. You know, how quickly can you can your JavaScript engine compile that code when it's being sent down as thousands of files instead of like you know smaller bundles? Um, and there's just lots of lots of little um, network stack optimizations I think still to be made. Uh, we're still looking for the right sets of benchmarks for you know what what are the experiences people want to be able to ship now that we you know now that modules are, are on the horizon. Um, are they going to want to ship like two and a half, three thousand modules? Um, which doesn't, you know, it sound, might sound crazy, but um, larger sites, you know, that are have got thousands of components may easily have that, that number of files. Uh, and so, you know, one thing we could definitely use from the community is trying to figure out, well, what types of loading experiences with, you know, ES6 modules are you probably going to want to try shipping down? Um, are you going to take advantage of everything the platform gives you, like you know, H2 server push and preload and all these other service worker and all these other different things? Um, what does your you know ideal loading story look like? So, uh, definitely open to more input from the community on what they want there. I think this is like a, a pretty interesting topic because um, every single thing that comes up in the context of mod module loading also comes up in the context of data loading, um, and so this is kind of a big question people have when they think about GraphQL is they're like, well. OK, yeah, so you can fetch multiple resources at once and like related resources and stuff like that. Like, won't, won't you not need that anymore with, when there's like HTTP2 or like something else like that? Um, but I'm not really sure that, you know, the, the difference is um, on the client, you're only going to get as much information as the server decided to send you about that page versus like when you're developing your app, uh, you have all the information about the entire code base and everything you might ever want to do. So I think there's always going to be optimizations you can only do inside your code and like inside a build tool or when you're deploying that a browser isn't really going to be able to do unless you give it all that information up front, in which case you're loading anything. So I feel like even if browsers do fully support modules, um, there's going to need to be some tooling that inspects your module tree ahead of time to avoid, even with HTTP2, doing like a separate round trip for, for everything or like even just a separate uh, request. Right on. I mean, yeah. the, the static plus dynamic is better than either, in my view. You want both. Uh, there's, there's still some open issues to be engineered. I think we have this, I don't know if people know about this, there's a separation into two, two connection pools in HTTP2 implementations in the client, the credential pool and the non-credential pool. And this makes it hard to get the kind of um, connection reuse and, and bundling and the round trip reduction you want if you have a bunch of um, sort of authorityless, uncredentialed modules that you want to load along with your app credentialed stuff. So, you know, this is complex, and I think the standards aren't quite there yet, but developers are really great at finding the, the, the best path forward. <laughs> I, I know what Eddie's talking about with 3,000 requests. We've seen, like, TMZ do 3,000 requests. A lot of it's ads and tracking, you know, Bray blocks that stuff. But I, in, the, in the long run, even with their um, connection reuse and um, handshakes and, and doing other clever things. Um, awesome stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I want to follow up a little bit on what Addy said. Oh, sorry, you're still talking. And so, uh-oh. I turned off my video to try to help. I'm having a Comcastic morning. Sorry. I know. That's, that's okay. Um, did you want to just repeat the last few sentences? Yeah, I'm saying that the re request response uh, exchange is all so if we can you know help through tools to bundle the stuff you need into one you know somewhat larger but still not too big download and we can tell from the tool what you need ahead of time that you're not going to want to load in little pieces that's just win-win and, and so I, I totally uh, agree with uh, the tool point Yeah, I, I, I fully believe that the uh, bundling genie is not going to go back in the bottle and that uh, it's here to stay. 
I, as, as, as Eddie said, I mean, a, a typical website might have upwards of a thousand modules or more uh, if you just look at their like browser fire webpack. Um, Webpack bundle, and uh, I'm not convinced that it's feasible to like you know make a thousand different requests just for one page, um, even in an H two world. Um, I, I think that the uh, the ideal number of bundles is is not one, and it's not uh, it's not five thousand. It's probably somewhere between those two. And yeah, when you have something like Webpack that understands the entire structure of your um, of your uh, resource graph, like why not just you know experimentally like figure out uh, exactly what the correct bundle size is, and then like come up with a set of best practices from that, and then have your your bundler emit that. I think that's the direction we're going to be heading in. I, I expect people will find you know okay, there is a dependency graph that's useful in modular on my site, but it isn't at the resolution of individual modules; it's the resolution of chunks. Um, and maybe home, maybe home loads a couple chunks, and also subsequent page loads will depend on those same chunks, and it will work out. Um, but I don't expect it will be at the individual file level. I'm sure people will deploy websites that way. Uh, I know I will probably do it just because uh, sometimes you want to throw something on GitHub pages and you're lazy. Um, but I don't think big sites are going to want to go down the path <laughs> of just like code on server equals code on client. There's a lot of really smart things we can do. Um, and I and, and I and great tools like Webpack absolutely help out uh, with that. And there are things that I you know I also want to be loath to just say the tools will figure it out. I think browsers will help play a role in um, maybe saying, hey, that tool seems to have a good approach, or hey, we you know we have a we have a straw man version of what this could look like, and hope hopefully it's it's a dialogue. Um, though we we do believe that the tool makers are going to make awesome tools. Ben Lush had a comment, um, like related to RxJS. So he he was looking at WebAssembly, and he said, "I can't really write a concurrency library to back RxJS with WebAssembly that can share memory in a way that can interop with JavaScript." Am I mistaken? There isn't a memory module that exists yet. So, like it, it would have to be created, as far as I understand. Limitations is that there is no. You have to basically allocate or create your own memory buffer each time for each module, and so really, what people need to do is, like, at least what we've joked about internally in Webpack is that there's going to be a big race to for somebody to create this great shared memory module or module system. We had another question about um, the parsing process of the file bundled by Webpack. Uh, uh, I feel like that's sort of a half question, but Sean, it's oh, what, what, in the what was the question? Uh, what what's the parsing process of the file bundled by Webpack? Oh, so um, <laughs> well, without getting too crazy in depth, uh, so everything in Webpack is treated as a module, and so we have this abstraction called a module or a normal module. Um, and so what happens is that after, let's say we can start with the entry file. It's a good place to start. Um, Webpack will get this path. And it doesn't really know it exists yet, but we send it off to a resolver. And we get more information about it. And once we verify that exists, we send it to, you know, we wrap it in this like fancy, uh, fancy term called a module or normal module. And we send it through a parser, we attempt to. If it's not a JavaScript file, or if Acorn Parser cannot parse this file, it actually sends it through our loader process it into something that can be parsed, aka JavaScript. Um, and so what happens is that once it is a parsable module, Pack will use Acorn to walk the AST and look for uh, lexical statements that describe dependencies. And so what that means is essentially we're looking for imports, requires, AMD requires, CommonJS requires statements. We attach that information like metadata onto the module itself. But we use it to actually also form, like we basically do that entire process for each dependency. We look at the path of that, see if it's module, if it is, try to parse it, and then re repeat until the whole graph is created. Hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> uh, Chase, are we good with uh, everything on uh, the questions? Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, cool. 
All right, so um, the next question I have is, um, what do you think, uh, actually, uh, what kind of statistics, statistics do we have um, around the adoption of certain APIs that um, are available for the web platform? Are there any stats in particular that are interested in? I'm just uh, curious, you know, because it was so, it, it, so far it looks like the web platform is something that, you, we, you know, we keep adding features to. It's, you know, we're always adding new features to it, uh, but do we, is there any way for us to know which features people are actually using? Um, at least on the Chrome side, I'm sure that my friends on the rest of the browsers could probably say their, their panels. So we've got chromestatus.com, which has got a metric section to it that um, tries to summarize some um, of the data that we have available on this stuff. And it sort of tries to break down usage metrics for like JavaScript, HTML, CSS features. So they could, they could check that out. Um, there's far too many APIs to read through what the stats say right now. So um, go check it out. Just a big, big plus one on the Chrome status stuff. Um, they're, the telemetry that they're collecting around API usage informs more than just them. I will say uh, <laughs> it's a it's a great public resource of what's out there. Um, it's a great sense of what's climbing in usage and what's dropping in usage as a percentage of web pages. Um, but yeah, um, browsers definitely instrument themselves and say, "Hey, how often does this code path light up um, as a proportion of traffic, or as a proportion of usage hours, or as a proportion of whatever you want to know?" Um, and we do track some of those numbers. Um, I know when um, when uh, the service worker came out, there was a discussion at Mozilla um, about um, like how many people really used App Cache? Like how many people really used App Cache? And the answer was more than zero, so we cannot ship. Um, however, um, if if enough people use it, there's enough there's actually discussion about re-implementing app cache under the hood in Firefox in terms of service worker. Um, so like things like that where we have, we definitely watch and monitor these usage patterns. Um, to get a sense for, okay, is this serving people's needs? Is it an evangelism problem? Um, or is it something where it's, is it a performance optimization problem? A lot of people are using this. Um, and it's kind of a, we know it's kind of a dog and we have a bunch of old backlog bugs that say, make it faster. Um, we should go prioritize those things. Um, but yeah, um, we're, we're, we're measuring and monitoring. And like Addy said, I don't have a large scroll here of numbers. Um, it's certainly something that can be determined. Sometimes that involves writing code and shipping it in the browser, and sometimes that's just going and looking at an existing count. But yeah. Yeah, I'd say ditto to what uh, what Posh said. Uh, and also, it, it is really important to, to keep an eye on these numbers uh, for us as browser vendors, because I mean, sometimes we remove stuff from the, the web platform, like you know, we wanted to move to remove application cache, or there was another one that uh, got removed recently. I think it was show modal dialogue, right? Which like was was just breaking so few sites, or it, it br did break a, a few sites, right? But uh, but it was, it was so few that the you know we felt like the the benefits outweighed the cost. So that's all IE four from IE four days. Uh, I think Netscape never had it. Um, and nobody likes modal dialogue, so I don't like blocking pop-ups. You uh, uh, Do you ever feel overwhelmed by uh, the or how, how does uh, how did how do you the, you know the browser teams feel about just the sheer volume of APIs? Like uh, it's a pretty broad, it's a pretty wide range of APIs that you need to maintain. What's your how, how does that occur to you on, on the team? We just assume the Chrome folks have like a massive factory on the moon where they produce these APIs. <laughs> and it's like, you ever seen that? This is an increasingly data reference, but the, the I love Lucy trying to keep up with the child, some of them in her mouth to try. We just have a factory of like 12,000 Alex Russells. They're just constantly training us. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm I'm just really glad that there are people like uh, Dominic and Anna who like I when I came when I went to the last W3C TPAC I remember just overhearing them excitedly talking about um, you know what happens when you're in Shadow DOM in a cross origin iframe uh, what happens to the history mm -hmm. API when you're navigating back and forth I'm just like I, I'm very glad that there are some very very smart people working on the web platform who imagine all the 20 different ways that these you know bazillion APIs can interact with each other it's uh, <laughs> 
it's amazing. So on, on that note, I'm curious, Brendan, when you were uh, when you were you know sitting down to because you needed to add some scripting functionality to Netscape, did you did you ever imagine that there could be a day when we'd be having conversation about this uh, uh, today, and we're talking about all these APIs that are available in the browsers? Uh, I, I thought, and I've said this recently, that it would either die with Netscape or go go big over time, and I'd be working on it in twenty two years. Um, I think JavaScript's 22 years old right about now. Go back 22 years, that was within the 10 days in May. Um, I'm a little terrified of web USB. I, I think people have compared it to web Bluetooth and they've realized, um, you know, we don't have the same people working on the APIs here. And sometimes they don't seem to even read each other's um, sort of prior work or other people's work. So the APIs tend to be <laughs> different in flavor, sometimes different in, in power. Um, having all these, these low-level APIs is, is causing people on Twitter to joke about, where's my web PCI bus? Where's my web DMA? <laughs> um, it's totally terrifying. Um, you know, my, my super game engine requires web DMA. Where is it? Uh, <laughs> I, I, that's a stuff of my nightmares. Um, I don't think we, we need all that. But uh, yeah, back in Netscape, Mike McHugh, who's now running Flipboard, I think it was 1999 or so, he said, we're going to get JavaScript into the, into the Intel hardware, into the CPU. <laughs> he was a prophet. Um, so I'm, I'm curious what the, you know, we, so we do have all this functionality that's constantly being added. Uh, I, I don't know uh, how this compares, but it seems to be, it seems to be that uh, JavaScript and the web platform is one of the most competitive platforms in terms of all the different APIs that are, that are available uh, across device from anything, I guess, in history of, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, is that accurate to say? I don't know how you compare it. Like Java J2ME, um, the this compact device stuff, had a lot of APIs. Um, C and C++ obviously can do anything and everything. When you're talking about code loaded over the network, JavaScript's hard to match. I was thinking about this the other day. There, there's actually a, a better is better JavaScript called um, James Gosling's News Network Extensible Window System. It used PostScript. It was done in the late 80s, early, really early 90s, when James was at Sun, before he did the first person Java work. It had clients and servers. It had code you would load, PostScript code you'd load from the server. You could even send PostScript back to the server. It had lots of advanced stuff in the setting of a workstation network or a LAN. I don't think they'd work through all the security needed for the web. Uh, but it was ahead of its time. Sometimes things are ahead of their time. Um, and so, you know, once JavaScript got on first and, and sort of survived through the end of the 90s, it, it was the only one that was going to scale. And even WebAssembly, right? You say WebAssembly is on the web archive. It's true. I think they're compiling to WebAssembly as well as ASM, but they're definitely compiling to ASM. Or last I looked, they were still making pure.js uh, co compilations available. So, um, you know, I, I don't think there's anything like JavaScript. Like, uh, I can't hear Brandon. Sorry, that, that's uh, how far back do I have to go? I don't think there's anything like JavaScript. Yeah, it's it's kind of like you know uh, biological life. It, it you can look back and say, oh, the network extensible window system from James Gosling could have been it, or somebody recently tweeted, oh, Lua, Lua was was already there in 1995. Why didn't you use Lua? Well, Lua was completely different back then. It changed incompatibly. No coroutines as I. Call. And if I'd wedged Lua in, which would have gone against 
my order is to make it look like Java, then we would have had a frozen 90s Lua, and everyone would be mad at me over that. <laughs> but, but JavaScript got out there in a way that means that people are trying to put web, you know, USB, web PCI bus, <laughs> web DMA. Um, this is kind of a victory condition. It also requires us, I think, to get back to the question of API proliferation, I think it does require us to look at look at APIs in the in the large and try to make sure we're not doing something that's excessively um, you know unnecessarily different in different sub sub domains of the API space, or that that has unsafe APIs we're going to regret later, like battery status is being withdrawn. I think. Um, Everyone knows about battery status, right? Yeah, I mean, it was being used for fingerprinting. I think Uber was seeing if your battery was nearly drained so they could charge you more. <laughs> it was bad. Um, so we have, to, we have to have some idea of what APIs shouldn't be there as well as what APIs should be there. I'll pause here. I'm calling Comcast. I'm on hold. <laughs> So what do you is one of the reasons you've got to optimize your loading performance, and it's just giving us a good example of that. <laughs> what do you guys think is going to uh, tip the scale um, towards uh, web web apps um, over native apps? I think demonstrating re-engagement is going to be important. Demonstrating that you can you, you know you can consistently monetize. Web apps, progressive web apps, just as well as native, is going to be important. Um, I think we have a lot of work left to do on things like navigation transitions. Um, I think the web has got powerful primitives for things like animations in general, but I still personally find it really difficult to you know transition between views in any of my applications, regardless of what framework I'm using. And I think that we've got a lot of work and a lot of interesting experimentation we can do there with like React Router and View Router and all these other things. Um, so I'm hoping that can be one of our focuses over the next sort of year and a bit. Um, lots of other interesting problems to solve, but what else? Yeah, well, I, I'm on the performance team, so I mean, maybe this is obvious, but I would say performance, performance, performance. Like we just gotta, you know, make web apps that actually look and feel as fast as native apps, and it, it's totally possible. It's just um, I, I find it's very it's very difficult, and I think that that's one place where tooling can come in. You know, when you do native development, there are a lot of kind of guardrails in place to make sure that you don't do the dumb thing. And then on the web, you know, uh, there's 50 different ways to do everything, and in my experience, 49 of them are slow, and one of them is fast. And uh, you might uh, accidentally stumble upon that one out of 50, um, or if you you know have memorized the 1,001 tricks to make your website fast, you might just know it by heart. But really, I feel like like tooling should just tell you like, hey, you're doing one of the dumb 49 things. Just do the the 50th one. It's fast. And um, meshing into that, uh, sort of the, the work that we're doing in the research division around uh, servo and um, parallelized layout and parallelized style computation and stuff like that is taking um, maybe another, hopefully finding a ways to make another 10 to 12 of those 50 fast. Um, so um, sort of splitting the difference between making sure we have great tools out there that tell developers, hey, this is the either, this is, either we're just gonna do it the fast way or we want you to do it the fast way, but also maybe expanding beyond the list of four things that can be fast on the web. Um, for animation and maybe saying, okay, can we just make most styling animations fast? Uh, the answer is probably, um, but it's, it takes, it's going to take a lot of re-architecture. Uh, I think, um, obviously, you know, I can't make promises that we're going to make all these things fast, but trying to make is a lot of the existing code or the more obvious seeming code out there fast um, is going to be a big part of making the web fast. It's going to be a little bit of developer education and potentially a lot of re-engineering. Uh, we had a question in the audience about Firefox. So I heard Firefox is experimenting with styles parallel processing, which should bump the performance of rendering by a factor of three. Is there any news there? I don't know where they're getting that factor of three from. Um, because uh, it's going to be a factor of to be determined after we integrate everything. 
is the actual <laughs> answer. Um, but um, obviously, you know, uh, style computation in parallel is going to pay big dividends, and we're borrowing that from the aforementioned Servo project. Um, and we're hoping to get that piece landed um, this year um, and have it pay some dividend. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and and get hate mail from all of my colleagues by making any number promises. But um, we're hoping it's a factor. It's a multiplicative factor on the existing performance. Um, not integer, probably. Adi, you mentioned uh, that uh, you're experimenting with the React, uh, React router or the, the view router to optimize uh, navigation transitions, potentially. Do you see um, that being the path to figuring out what um, what ultimately the solution for uh, you know for like stack navigation might be in mobile apps uh, that are written natively? I mean, to be honest, I think there's a trinity here of sort of authors, um, browsers, and tools that are going to be necessary for us to figure this all out. There are probably web platform primitives that we could be working on. I know Jake Archibald uh, a while back was exploring navigation transitions as a as a thing. I don't know if it's gone anywhere just yet. But um, I think that there's probably going to be more that we can do at a web platform level to enable um, navigation transitions to be done in a slightly more efficient manner. Um, in the meantime, um, I personally, again, feel like there's a lot more experimentation we could be doing in the community to say, OK, well, you know, this is, this is what I'm trying to accomplish. Here's an example of where I'm using the platform as well as I can. And you know, it's either really hard or I just can't make this fast enough. And if you can hand something like that off, whether it's done using React Router or the React Router or View Router or whatever have you, um, over to a browser team, we can try to make that faster. We can try to figure out if there's something we're extracting there into an API we can explore or try to standardize. Um, I still think animations are, uh, those types of um, view uh, transitions are something that we, we still need to noodle on for, for quite some time. If someone wanted to, if someone had a um, a really good app um, that you know they're proud of and you know think they, they did a really good job uh, optimizing it, what would be the process for them to you know to let you know that this is something that they, they can show you? Tweet this this fine group of people. <laughs> Tweet this panel. Cool. Um, so uh, to take that a little bit further. Uh, the there are. I don't know what the stats are today, but there, I think there's definitely over 100,000 apps or a million apps now in uh, Android uh, Android App Store. I don't know what the numbers are, but probably something crazy like that. Uh, but we know that uh, it's quite probably safe to assume that not every application that is written for the Android um, native platform, in this, you know, or iOS uh, needs to be um, a a native application, right? It's just it's probably safe to assume that that's not every application is pushing the performance boundaries of, of native devices. Um, what what is missing from from people considering those kind of use cases as um, you know for those use cases considering building with mobile web um, as opposed to you know building another native app for the store. I feel like this is a very good Alex Russell question. <laughs> <laughs> if, well, if you say his name two more times, he'll appear. <laughs> Show the phone. Um, the phone. Um, yeah. I mean, a big, <laughs> Go ahead, Pudge. I was say a big piece of this is going to be discoverability. I mean, yeah, you said there's a million apps in the Android store, and yeah, and granted, the web is not. I'm not going to say a, a silver bullet for discoverability for an existing for an application. But especially as we're moving into this new class of web apps, there's this whole new desire to showcase these outstanding versions of these things. And if you do something, um, A, it's just going to show. And B, it's just because your app is doing a slightly better job of bubbling that to the top. If I understood that question correctly, and we're talking about sort of why would you, or what would make you want to move to a different channel. but um, yeah, uh, go ahead, Nolan. I was just going to say, well, I, I was on a podcast recently with Alex, so maybe I can try to stand in for him a little bit. 
because uh, Alex Russell on the Chrome team, he, he made a really interesting point, I think, in a uh, blog post recently about this, where he brought up something that I, I don't think anyone had actually articulated before that I think is quite true, which is that uh, he pointed out that a lot of uh, the reason for kind of uh, web blindness, like people focusing so much on mobile apps, mo uh, native mobile apps, is, is really Android blindness. It's that a lot of the decision makers, you know, CEOs, they're all carrying iPhones, right? And um, if the, the roles were reversed between iOS and Android, and if iOS was the awesome place where you go to build progressive web apps and you know all the APIs were supported and everything, then arguably there'd be a lot more interest, uh, since they are the decision makers and they're the influencers um, in the web. And uh, that's it's kind of a big blind spot, especially considering that, what, Android is like, uh, Eddie, help me out, it's like 80% of the mobile, uh, mobile market right now, worldwide, something like that? Uh, let's say it's a big number. <laughs> I was trying to coax it out of you, but uh, all right, fine. I think I think one thing is though that like the discoverability goes both ways, right? Like when I'm looking for something to use on my phone, I'm looking for a great experience. I don't like go and do a web search. I go to the app store and I search directly there. So in some ways, if you've made like a to-do list app or something, um, I'm, you're just going to get discovered by people searching in the app store for to-do list app, not by people like. Googling like best to do list app for Android or something. I think it's a highly nuanced question as well, right? Because if you're an established brand, people are going to go to whatever it is that offers them the best experience, right? Like I, I personally use Twitter Lite, for example, like their new progress web app. I use that on iOS. I've been using it on iOS for quite some time and I don't use the native app there um, just because I find that to, to be a little bit lo lower friction for me to use. Um, whereas if you're like a mom and pop shop or you're you know a smaller business just trying to launch a completely brand new experience, yeah, maybe the discoverability aspect of it um, is more important to you. Uh, and you know we also have to I think acknowledge the fact that um, in those ecosystems where you have things like you know the Play Store and, and um, the App Store and so on, uh, it just just having that in place doesn't necessarily mean that someone is going to go and install your app, right? We know that there are stats that say that people generally keep you know, four or five, um, at most in some cases, uh, pinned apps on their home screen month on month. Um, and so, you know, being discoverable is great. Being something that people keep around is also a challenging problem. Um, and I'm, I, I personally find it interesting that, um, I really, really great actually that, um, you know, Microsoft and, and Bing and so on are also exploring, you know, looking at how, you know, you can maybe highlight things like progressive web apps in search. Um, there's going to be lots of different UX experiments that we can do across the board here. Uh, hopefully, we'll eventually end up on something that, that gives users value. Did Microsoft just announce that the MS Build that they're going to be including uh, or 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 kind of uh, bubbling up the um, the uh, 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 progressive web apps in, in their store? Yeah, I guess I should speak to that since I'm the Microsoft guy. Uh, yeah, so we did just announce that. Um, I think we'd, we'd mentioned it in a blog post um, that we were kind of thinking in, in this direction, a blog post by Jacob Rossi a, a few months ago called The Progress of Web Apps. But basically, yeah, we're really interested in solving this problem of uh, discoverability and kind of uh, bridging the gap between native apps and web apps in terms of the store. So um, we're, we're still kind of trying to figure out exactly what that's going to look like. You know, it raises interesting questions. There's a lot of uh, you know un unanswered questions here, like, um, you know, what happens if you're uh, web app gets automatically ingested into the store. Like, who's the store author? What if the store uh, requires a rating system? Like, do we need like? And we've been we've been asking all these questions um, on the uh, web apps manifest GitHub for a long time. Of like, hey, can we add um, you know can we add this uh, field to the manifest.json file? You know, for like a rating system uh, or or something like that. Because um, you know, various stores have various requirements. It's it, it, it's really, really interesting. I think it'll be a it'll be a fun space to watch over the next year or so. What I find interesting is that so I've been using a, a Reddit app, a mobile app, and I'll go in there and then they'll still have a little pop up that says, you know, why don't you use a native app? It's uh, you know thirty percent faster. And I'm like, I actually really like the fact that I don't need to download anything. Uh, and it's uh, it seems to me that um, with the uh, Twitter uh, Twitter Lite. In theory, it seems like a really good idea that you could that you could actually get a feature. If they want to push your feature out tomorrow, you can get a feature just refresh. But get like you, you can get that feature by refreshing your page, right? The moment they push it, you refresh your page and you got that feature, um, as opposed to you know a, an icon pops up in my store and that says you know it, you have one update. You know you go in there and you hit the update button and then 80 megabytes later you get that feature. 
also thinking about it for people, let's say in India where data is more expensive, you're only paying for it when you go to that application versus having to go to the download store, et cetera, for apps you don't use. We had a few more questions. So one question is, um, when, if ever, would it be the right time to move beyond the document model? Has there been much effort to create a web application model? What does that mean? No DOM, or maybe something more I, than DOM? I, I think I, could, I might be able to fill in a little bit. I mean, I, I don't know exactly what the person is referring to, but I think it's, uh, uh, it seems that uh, you know, there was understanding of publishing that, was, that got encoded in the browsers as the you know, publishing a document in XML format. And, and I don't know if this is what the person is referring to, but maybe there could be something that, is, like, that defines an application on a higher level. But I feel like we might be actually moving towards that, right? It is, it is, it, uh, the um, experimentation that the frameworks are doing and understanding what are the things that we need to be productive in building these applications could at some point settle into, like, this is actually how you scaffold, sc scaffold an app at a higher level. These are the, so, you know, Adi, like what you were suggesting, that there might be an API that, you know, this, this, route, this app exposes the following routes, these route, and, and kind of at the higher level, so you can optimize um, the, um, the actual uh, presentation of that um, uh, on, a uh, on the device level for, for that application. Yeah, um, I, was at, I was speaking at JSConf last week, and, and Tom Dale gave a great talk there about sort of um, this shift towards frameworks and their tooling becoming more like compilers more than anything else, um, where the compiler is generating sort of this, um, ideally this optimal version of the experience for the browser where it's making the right decisions for you, it's trying to avoid doing too much during runtime, I think things like ahead of time compilation, et cetera, are, are good shifts in a, in a direction where they're making the right calls for you. Um, and yeah, you know, to the point about the you know the document model, there are already people that are using you know WebGL and Canvas as, as alternative renderers um, for things. I think that we need to be cognizant that there are places where that that might make sense, like games, for example, or places where you need to have that level of control. But there's also a lot that um, those that using those things requires you to hand roll yourself, like taking care of accessibility. Right, like if everyone was rendering to Canvas today, you know, we saw you know a couple of years ago folks experimenting with things like React Canvas or what have you, and it just requires you know it might sound like an amazing idea at the time, but re implementing the entire like accessibility tree and you know keyboard accessible and all those things yourself is just it's so much work that I think folks just have to make sure. Yeah, I think it was Flipboard maybe that was experimenting with it. Um, I think folks need to just make sure that you know when they say they want to to have a different render for a thing. They're using it for the right reasons. I don't know if other folks had comments on that, but yeah. Yeah, I Flipboard would... did, did a React Canvas a few years back because they needed a fast, you know, custom view scrolling, and the, the DOM of the day couldn't do it, and probably still can't. But like, like you said, Audi, the there's nothing like tech. Text and if you're using any amount of text, you don't want to do it on, on, on your own on Canvas and then have to worry about making it accessible. I think that's just going to be a trail of tears. Um, the, the DOM is, is much maligned, the DUM, as my uh, Polish accented friend calls it. Um, but I, I don't think it's, it's one thing. You can't blame the DOM. You have to be um, careful what you use and how often you use it. You have to actually ride a learning curve that's a little steep right now, but it's getting getting easier over time. And I think that means that we won't go purely to GL-based rendering, um, at least not directly. It, it'll come in through the, the, the HTML engines using the GPU one. Yeah, the, the other thing I, I, I'd add is that I, I think a lot of a lot of people maligning the DOM may, may just not be optimizing the DOM as much as they should be. I mean, like, I, I did native Android development for a long time, and, you know, we would, like, we would try to reduce the number of, of tags as much as possible, the number of elements as much as possible in order to keep memory down, right, on mobile devices. And uh, I see some web apps where it's just, like, you count the number of DOM elements, which uh, this is a great experiment. Just go to your go to your web page and open up the, the dev tools. 
and just do you know document uh, query selector all star dot length and just see how many elements you have and then compare it to like you know a really well coded site like you know Gmail or something. Um, and you might be surprised that you have like you know like double or triple what they have, and you might be just maybe you have like a, a list, an infinite scrolling list, and the more you scroll down, you just keep adding DOM elements, and suddenly your your web app gets slower and slower, and you're wondering what's going on here. Well, you really have to be careful not to you know overuse the DOM, not to overuse uh, DOM elements, and like you know use things like virtual lists, stuff like that. Um, there, there, there's smart ways to use the DOM to make it so you don't have to throw away you know accessibility, Control F, SEO. Um, you know, translation tools, like all the, all this nice stuff you throw away when you just render to Canvas. I think part of this, and I don't I don't know if it's necessary necessarily the fault of um, you know browser vendors or, or 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 something else, but I feel like a lot of people don't necessarily fully understand the limitations of of what the browser can do. Um, maybe that part of that's advocacy. Like we haven't. I, I think most people don't know that at least on the Chrome side, we try to recommend people keep their overall total number of DOM nodes to like under 1,500, right? And you'll see plenty of pages where people are doing a lot more than that. Um, I, I don't know if you if you all remember, but I also remember someone like creating this like custom select box where they pre-populate like a bajillion different things in it, and um, people just don't realize what, what you know what the limitations of a browser um, are today. So you know maybe we can. Um, Better expose, you know, limitations and steer people in the right direction. Like on our side, we're trying to do that with tools like Lighthouse. I know other folks are experimenting with other ideas too. Um, but yeah, uh, limitations are a good thing to know about. It's ironic that the DOM is really better used for a view, and and if you have a model that has you know millions and millions of nodes in some kind of graph, you probably don't want to make those be DOM nodes. Um, Hixie has this crazy. HTML video where he makes each pixel in a video the a, a, a DOM element, right? It's a torture test. Um, obviously, you, you can always make too many objects in memory using any tool or framework or language. Um, don't do that. Maybe, maybe the problem is that it's so easy to do with HTML and the DOM relative to other platforms. And lastly, what? I'd argue that we haven't been, like, Yes, it's called the document object model, but it's where most people aren't making documents anymore. People are. Um, people are making, you know, URL, unique URI, you know, addressable data documents, but most people are making application experiences. And, and maybe the argument is that we're currently shoehorning it, but most of the development and work we've been doing in the past 10 years has been to enhance, you know, to further the building of applications and not the building of documents. Um, obviously, that's not 100% true, but we've done a lot of work into making the web into a platform for interactive sort of single page experiences. So um, unless, they, unless they mean, you know, a, a different node tree based or replacing the node tree based model of a page, I, I, I would say that we've already kind of ended the era of the document. One of the challenges that I see with uh, uh, with people, because I, I help people learn how to build applications. So uh, one of the things that I would get sometimes, uh, sometimes is, or I generally, I don't get a, in the Ember world, nobody really sees DOM as a problem, because we don't really think of the DOM as something that we have to, we don't explicitly manipulate DOM, right? It's only like on the leaf node where you need to do something very specific with a DOM element that might ever happen. but on a day-to-day, -day, you're manipulating state that gets reflected. So in, uh, for people that bought into using a framework uh, to focus on what you need to build as opposed to uh, manipulating the DOM to reflect what you want to accomplish, uh, for those people, DOM is not a problem. But I think for people that haven't, uh, you know, if, you, um, if you're still kind of crafting every user interaction by manipulating the DOM, then you know I could see how the DOM being a much bigger um, part of your thinking on a daily basis. Um, but I think these, uh, but Adi, I think what you said about you know keeping the, uh, the DOM to less than fifteen hundred nodes, I think it's a really interesting way of thinking of how you're going to architect your application. Because I know for sure there are, there are people that are building um, uh, like platform, or they're building responsive applications that that will have. A fully functional view that's rent, that's hidden for desktop, and then they're presenting it, uh, presenting the mobile view, and the user can interact 
with the mobile view, but they're actually both, um, you know, kind of behind the scenes interacting with both at the same time. Cool. So, um, what is uh, what do you think is uh, a web platform feature that you would like people to start using today? That it may be underutilized or something that you think is like people that that's really it right now. Uh, service workers, service workers, service workers, please. Um, I feel like there are a lot of people that, and and we've got you know we've got increasingly good tooling for service worker both both the sort of a debugging level, but also libraries and tools around this for lowering the friction of using it. Whether it's with Webpack or Gulp or NPM scripts, um, I I'm going to give a um, a shout out to SW Precache and SW Toolbox just because my team work on those things. Um, but if you're regardless of whether you're using a tool for it or just manually writing your own service worker code. Um, there are some decent performance gains to get on that um, for returning uh, visits your users can get to your site. Um, you have complete control over the caching story there. Um, on, uh, and at least Chrome, you also get early opted into things like the V8 code cache to decrease your overall sort of um, parsing compilation times uh, if you have to also be using Service Worker. Um, and we're, we're starting to see really big companies. Again, I, I, I hate to keep using Twitter as an example, but Twitter Lite uses Service Worker um, for static asset caching and application shell caching. Um, and I think that that's something that you know, more and more of us can be using. Uh, we, can, we can start investing in those experiences so that you know, we don't have to necessarily keep going back out to the network when we don't have to. Um, I also saw that uh, Edge had some, had some fun announcements around Service Worker uh, support in there. So I'm going to thank Nolan entirely for it. Um, I, one question that I had, uh, I'm privileged here because I'm actually on the call, is um, what should people do if they're building their application on top of service workers, but they also want to support browsers that don't support service workers? Like, for example, you know, uh, Safari on, on iPhone is like a pretty non-negotiable browser that everyone needs to work with, um, which doesn't have you know, any whiffs of implementing that. I, I I can't speak for the Safari team, but they have been involved in the the service worker face to face meetings, and uh, I I think they're showing interest at least. So there are there are there are, there are signs of hope. Uh, in any case, uh, as a representative of a browser that doesn't yet support service worker, I would say you can still fall back to app cache. Other things like the Webpack offline plugin, I think, just does this. Um, just allows you to just fall back from service worker to app cache. That's okay. Um, there's another thing which is not strictly service worker related, nor is it a, a replacement for service worker, but kind of a, an interesting API that just got shipped in uh, Firefox and Edge, uh, which kind of flew under the radar, I think, is immutable caching, which is basically this idea that you can uh, set a, a header where you see cache control immutable on an asset that you know will never ever change whatsoever, because say you know it has, let's say it has the checksum in the in the file name, and then even if the user were to just jam the the F5 button over and over again, it would just never send a request to the server, which uh, I think Facebook saw you know really reduced their number of um, of three or four re revalid revalidations. Uh, so that's in uh, Firefox and Edge now, and then Chrome has an equivalent where uh, I believe if you, if you just set the um, the age to be something greater than I, I don't know, Addy, is it like a year or something? I said it to I just said it to a year, and then Chrome showed the same behavior. So um, that's cache control immutable. Uh, Mozilla Hacks has a really good blog post explaining how it works. Um, from a CSS side, um, just be, uh, just because I've been really excited about it, CSS Grid um, for layout and two dimensional layout, um, and you know just you know, you want that nice application looking layout, it's much, much easier to do. It's flexbox with two dimensional constraints, effectively. It's really slick. Um, and there's tons of great resources out there. And um, every browser that supports CSS Grid also supports the at supports, uh, you know, uh, directive in CSS, which means you have universal ability to test for grid support, which is really, really cool. Um, and, um, I believe everyone is on track to either support it very soon or already supports it. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty fun. Um, it, it, it reduces the amount of code you have to write to do nice two-dimensional layout by a lot. Cool. And I did to add something to what you said um, about service workers. Uh, I, it made me think of um, of the time when you know of the. 
Web 2.0 days when the Ajax kind of hit the market, right? Because it, it seems to me that um, the, the call to action on using service workers is a little bit of, of like saying, like, you know, start using XML HTTP requests. You know, because I think uh, really what, um, what we're saying is there is um, a user experience that, uh, th that service workers enable. Right, so, start, so in a way, what maybe what the, the call to action there might be is like start building those user experiences that, that require service workers as a solution. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, essentially kind of a, a good example of that is the Twitter app again, right, Twitter Lite, is that, uh, that very quick, responsive user experience that you can deliver, a uh, very light app. Um, and, uh, and, so, and there's some tools that, that, that make uh, you know, that, that fall out from that, that I'd really like to talk about uh, at some point, the GraphQL stuff, right, where, we, you know, if you're building a, a very light app and you need, to, you need to ask for exactly what you want, um, then GraphQL is kind of like the way to do it, right, it seems. Yeah, I guess the, the difference there is that um, service workers, for example, are not at all polyfillable, right? Um, like GraphQL is something you can use on any platform without having to wait for that platform to support that. Um, but it's a good point that like with some stuff like App Cache, you can get some of the benefits. Um, I guess like when I when I've heard some of our engineers talking, it's um, like there were definitely existing APIs that provided similar functionality um, that you know were more cross browser and service workers are like a totally new thing, right? So you definitely can get some of the experiences that you can get from service workers today from other existing browser APIs. Um, and it's appealing to use those because there's something that's supported today across browsers. Um, like, for example, a combination of um, app cache and like IndexedDB, for example. Is there any tooling that uh, you're aware of that enables, like you could say, for example, kind of like with Babel, you can say, I would like to target the following browsers, so it will, Babel will automatically compile down to a specific feature, uh, you know, specific, you'll use specific features um, that are available in those browsers. Is there anything like that for the, um, uh, for building uh, like progressive web apps, where you could say, I want to be able to support these browsers, and, you know, what features can I, uh, can I use safely to build an application? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I think most of most of the companies that I see adopting progressive web apps uh, tend to have a good feel for what features um, they they want to support, and uh, by progressive enhancement, I'm just checking that you know things are supported. They will either switch on or switch off particular features. So, you know, a site that happens to be using service worker caching or web push notifications um, can still ship a great experience in other browsers. Um, it might not have you know um, the same uh, instant loading on repeat views uh, experience or, or the same level of web push applications or anything like that, but it can still be an experience that's good for users. Um, otherwise, I haven't seen anything like that just yet. Um, maybe that means there's an opportunity for someone to build it. Do, do we have, oh, sorry, Alexander, you're going to say, oh, Sashka. Oh, no, I was just going to say um, that's actually something that uh, we've been looking at with Meteor. Um, is figuring out how we can enable people to get all those modern features across different browsers, but um, without like a lot of configuration. Because yeah, right now you definitely have to like be really aware of what you're trying to target and which features you can use. Um, but something like progressive web apps should be something you can get by default uh, in whatever tool you're using. So I'm really excited to see also what uh, the Webpack team might be doing there in terms of. Like the new Webpack CLI, for example, might also have a lot of opportunities to get people this stuff out of the box. Um, Sean, what do you think about that? <laughs> Trying to unmute my mic, but it's not letting. It, it was taking a moment to unmute my mic. So yeah, we are, we have a lot of like promising. Uh, hope for the Webpack CLI because it's going to allow us to have people you know who can make opinionated decisions and awesome presets and share those to give people an instant kind of bootstrap experience. And so uh, I'm hoping that that you know is we see more of the community kind of take a look at the scaffolding system, take a look at how to create a preset, 
can kind of really get on board in trying to create, uh, you know, even a more rich ecosystem you know, around Webpack and Webpack CLI. Do we know, do we have any stats on, on or uh, can we make any educated guesses of how much work it is to build Twitter Lite versus an equivalent for the native platform? Um, we don't really have stats on that. I'm, I'm not sure how long it took Twitter to build their native application. I know that they've been iterating on it as well for a long time. Um, working with Twitter on their PWA, I know that you know they, they, the initial big rewrite of their mobile site um, took sort of, you know, it, they started on it a year ago. Um, but most of the performance work and the, the really shiny PWA work uh, has happened over the last six months. Um, and it's not, it's not a huge team or anything like that. Um, the, the fact that they've been able to ship an experience used by you know, a, a large number of people is, is still kind of great. Um, I would say it's, it ends up being proportional to how, how complex is the experience that you're shipping to people. You know, if someone's got um, a one or two view app, it's going to take a lot, you know, a lot less time to turn that into a PWA than something that, you know, uh, is, is a lot more broad and also has to factor in, you know, like web push and so on. So there's, it's a, it, there's an amount of nuance there. It's a short answer. You, you guys must have seen this awful uh, April 19th super Twitter thread. Some of you were in on it. Ken Wheeler you know, was <laughs> brawling about the web sucking versus native. Um, and I yes. said, you know, so Twitter, PWA, what's, what's missing? And he said, the native Twitter is better integrated. I get badge and toast notifications and notifications on my watch. I can upload and edit different media types. The UI transitions are smoother and make more sense. I can share it from other share it to it from other apps. I have a GIF menu or GIF menu, and pull to refresh doesn't require scrolling more after it refreshes. I'll stop here. For at least one of those things, I know that we're. Um we're experimenting with web share um, as an API and share target. And Twitter were one of the earlier folks uh, trying that out before the origin trial um, wrapped up. So we'll hopefully see some, some further work there in the coming months. Um, I totally agree. So the, um, some of the reason why I do think that we, we need to, to put more effort into figuring out navigation transitions on the web is, is from that thread. You know, it's a good, a good example of um, where we currently don't have you know, fantastic solutions for people. Um, and we need to be able to enable that stuff in a, in a low friction way. Um, on deeper integration into sort of the OS, uh, we've been experimenting with that again um, as part of deeper integration of PWAs into Android. And uh, people can go and play around with, with that today. So, you know, your PWA can have the same presence in the app drawer and in sort of search in the same place where you, you know, go and check on how much storage space the app is using out and so on. Um, so I feel like we're, I feel like we'll eventually converge on that point. Um, some of these problems are going to take a lot longer to solve than other ones. Um, the animations went again. But uh, yeah, um, definitely want to keep talking to Ken and figure out how we can help. Do you guys know if Ken was talking, when he said that the native app was better, was he talking about Android or iOS? He said watch, so I think iOS, but I could okay. be wrong. I could be an Android watch. Um, yeah, I think some of those were just bugs to fix on the Twitter app. Some of them are gaps, like Adi mentioned, web share. I think web animations could be cool. You know, I'm worried about the exceptions to the statelessness, but animation is a pure function of time with something flash nailed and in some ways still is the only, you know, really great exemplar of. But web animations are coming. They're, I mean, they're here. They're in Chrome and Firefox, right? I don't know where they are in, in, Ed, in Edge. Uh, they're they're a bit away, but we're uh, we're laying the foundations for it. I, th I think that Houdini also might offer some interesting solutions there, because uh, like uh, I think Rachel Neighbors made this point recently about how uh, I, think, I think WebKit shipped a um, a spring animation. It's kind of like a, I believe it's proprietary. It's not uh, there's there's no right. standard for it, but it, but it does kind of speak to like this need for you know a richer set of animations. Because when, when you're when you're you know using a native app, like one of the things that's kind of um, that you unconsciously like learn to love about it, especially if you're on iOS, I think, um, where there's kind of like a slightly higher bar for quality. I don't think it's controversial to say that. Um, like you get used to all these like you know 
rubber bandy, springy, like, you know, animations all over the place. And all of that stuff is really, really hard to do on the web with just Bezier curves. And uh, you know, she made the point, it'd be nice to have, like, a more generic way to define animations that do, you know, whatever bouncy, rubber bandy, springy thing you want to do. Can WebAssembly be used uh, to enable some of these, to like to power some of these kind of, if you wanted to create a really complex, uh, uh, you know, provide a library that enables more complex uh, uh, calculations around or uh, animations that require more complex um, calculations? Like, could, would, could that be a place to use WebAssembly to provide a library that does that? It's, I think you need more low-level view uh, access because you don't want to run, even in WebAssembly, on the main or the UI thread. You want to run on another thread, the compositor thread. You want to do the Houdini things or, or something like them. You have to offload sort of your 60 frame a second, move the texture around in shared memory with the GPU under touch control. You have to offload that from your, your main thread where JavaScript runs. So if WebAssembly is only running or JavaScript runs, even if there's shared array buffers and workers, that's not going to help the sort of the really touch or fast response, custom scrolling sort of stuff, or, or, or some of the things that Ken Wheeler mentioned. Houdini could. I need to just say Merica. <laughs> Uh, Brendan, did you want to ask, answer that question on uh, chat? It was, what do you think about reason MLs? Uh, reason ML, <laughs> it's, it's a version of ML. I love ML. Um, I'm more of a standard ML than OCaml type, but um, it's nice. Uh, I was at the React conf by accident. <laughs> Somebody let me in because um, they saw me eating lunch in the same hotel. Um, and the end of the conference was very inspiring, and it talked about Reason ML and React converging in five years and being this sort of one runs everywhere language. Um, sounds good to me. I, I feel like there, there's a, a certain amount of language. Um, enthusiasm here, which I think is fine. Um, but I'd like to have separation of concerns so that Sorry, there's... Oh. Did I have whip again? No, no, go ahead. Uh, the, all the good stuff that people like about ML and reason ML on the language level, um, that's cool. And you can compile that to JavaScript, maybe WebAssembly someday things that help you write apps more uh, quickly and be more productive, and things that you need in the browsers to run those apps well, I think can to some extent be separated and should be available for all um, app authors, whether they use Reason ML or not. That, that's all I have to say. I, I'm reminded of, you remember um, Cappuccino, um, early sort of, Objective C like uh, JavaScript to you know JavaScript trend compiler really um, cool stuff very much inspired by the the Apple um, Objective C uh, you know uh, App Kit or whatever stack a little bit too locked in in that sense if we can have uh, people people can do that if they want and it's great Let, let's have sort of an integrated world you live in where you're thinking in one language and you're writing, you know, reason ML and JSX is just part of it. But, um, but the, the underlying piece is what I'm interested in is that the web standards absorb as much as they can that doesn't tie you into one source language or set of tools. And that, that's, that's an iterative process of sort of abstracting those out of these, these innovations. So yeah, reason ML is great. I'd like to see the web standards interacting in a way that doesn't Leave it as another um, cappuccino. I'd I'd like to um, I'd like to bring up uh, GraphQL because I think it's it's a really interesting. Um, it's a, it, inter there's a lot of interesting development happening right now. There's there are companies adopting GraphQL. Um, I think uh, 
uh, Shopify uh, has a, a big audience of um, creators that, that create for their platform. They just released Gra uh, GraphQL API. I think there's a few more uh, big names. Um, I'm curious um, if there are, if from the you know, framework makers and um, Shashko and uh, you know, Sean, what, what do you think uh, this, the, this, uh, you know, the introduction of GraphQL and the, you know, the growing adoption of GraphQL, like what, what does that suggest to you? Or what, what do you how do you interpret that um, in, um, in a context of uh, kind of the evolution of the web platform and what it enables? Well, like I see GraphQL as enabling some way for, you know, build tools to statically analyze information that can be coming in from an external external resource, um, and so it gives you a little bit more, you know, just because of how it's, you know, how GraphQL is structured and, and how data is expected into your application, um, it kind of gives some new possibilities, uh, things that we haven't um, investigated ourselves, but uh, there have been people. Um, like the author of Gatsby.js, who has really been tinkering around with the possibility of trying to, you know, in some way load GraphQL resources that are extremely heavy, but in a static way. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think the first thing to mention is that people often um, hear the term API and they start thinking about public GraphQL APIs, but like 99.9% .9 of usage of GraphQL is one that you don't notice at all. It's people communicating between their own server and their own client-side application. Um, because it's quite a big risk to have a public GraphQL API right now, because you have to convince a bunch of people on the internet that that's a good idea. But it's a lot easier to convince people inside your company that it's a good idea. Um, I think the the biggest thing about it is it's it's the only it's the first thing I think that has really come along um, since you know REST APIs in some sense that actually has a chance of being the next generation way that um, everyone handles their data. Uh, it happens to, in my opinion, have just the right combination of um, flexibility where there are a few things you can't do with it, um, and at the same time, giving you just enough benefits that it's compelling to work with that. And in terms of like, you know, the context of this panel here, I think, uh, you know, on the Apollo team, we spend all this time building frameworks and tooling and whatever around GraphQL. Um, but the end game is that people, the same people will be building tooling around GraphQL that build tooling around HTTP, right? Like our hope is that five years from now, you'll look in the Chrome Dev Tools and you'll see GraphQL data in there um, because it'll be widespread enough that it would be crazy not to support that in, in every browser tool. Or like instead of us maintaining the standard iOS client for uh, GraphQL, it'll be like Apple maintaining you know, as part of their core iOS library, a uh, GraphQL client implementation, just like they have an HTTP client implementation. Um, so that's kind of where I really see this going, because the amount of pickup that we see of this, like, around all kinds of different companies, I think is just, like, off the charts. Yeah, I, th I think the core insight is something like, like GraphQL or Relay. And I, I would consider it as part of kind of a larger movement where, you know, you'd have things like Falcor, um, JSON API. I, I, I would count CouchDB, CouchDB, which I work on as kind of in this larger family. I think the core insight there is that I think we're kind of tired, or a lot of people are tired of handcrafting our own custom REST APIs every time we build an app. Like I, I think it was Tom, it was either Tom Dale or Yehuda Katz who had a blog post about this talking about uh, JSON API a few years ago where he articulated it really well. He said it's 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 kind of nuts that every time you write a new app, you know, you're just gonna like invent your own REST API, and then you know you're gonna debate endlessly whether it's true REST or not. You know, like who even knows what true REST is? But the one thing we're sure of is that we're gonna rewrite the we're gonna rewrite the damn thing every single time we write an app. And it's like we don't rewrite our you know database query language every time we write a new app. Why are we doing this for server to client communication? I really like this idea of just like you just point your client at an endpoint and it just figures out everything else. You know, there's some well defined contract between those two. Um, so I think that's really exciting. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is um, people people often say like, yeah, other technologies have done similar things, um, but the really big difference I think is that uh, GraphQL provides a specification for that and not actually specific technologies, right? So like Falcor is similar in some ways, but the biggest problem with Falcor is that there's no specification for how Falcor is supposed to work. There's just the one library that you install in your client and your server 
which kind of defines how it works. Um, but with GraphQL, you know, there's language and servers in every single language. And it's like everyone's in the standoff where like if you want to make a significant change to how it works, you have to talk to everybody at the same time. Um, and I think for something to really be the future of data loading, I think it has to be in that kind of space where it doesn't rely on a particular implementation, um, but it's a specification that everyone can build to so that different tools can work together without being built by the same people. Are you talking about maybe doing something like GraphQL for bundling component trees and maybe doing some sort of intelligent lazy loading based on based on that or something else? Oh, I'm I'm just talking about how like um, like you can build uh, GraphQL tooling into a browser and build that for the specification, um, and you don't have to worry about what server somebody's using for their GraphQL server because there's only one way to fulfill the GraphQL spec, and it's like required, or else you're not actually a GraphQL server. But um, there definitely are a lot of things you can do with GraphQL other than data loading. But I guess I'm, I'm talking specifically about stuff like, you know, people often debug their REST API calls by looking at, like, the Chrome Network tab. Um, and in the Chrome Network tab, you know, you get to see the URL. But in GraphQL, the URL is not very interesting anymore. The URL is always just, like, slash GraphQL. Um, but you would want to be able to see, like, what queries you're loading, um, you know, you would want to be able to see the status of your client-side GraphQL cache, which might really, really, really later be built into the browser and not like a library that you import. Um, so I think like, you know, basically if we get enough people on board, like companies like, you know, Facebook and GitHub and you may hopefully eventually like Google uh, on board with the specification and everyone can be collaborating on that, then those kinds of things can happen. And right now, like when you're using a REST API, it's really convenient because everyone's kind of agreed that like these are the kinds of things you should show inside those those dev tools, um, but not everyone has agreed yet on the next generation thing. Are you aware of any um, any f functionality or is there something about GraphQL that could be optimized at the browser level? So you know if if this thing was available in a browser, it would just make GraphQL make so much more sense or so much easier to implement or whatever that might be? Uh, I definitely think the main thing is just the tooling. Um, there are certainly opportunities to do stuff um, like introduce uh, more efficient transports, but I think that would apply just as equally to REST APIs, right? Like one of the main reasons I think that people use JSON for their API is because it's something that's very easily human readable. Um, but it's not particularly the most efficient way to encode or decode data or transfer it over, over the wire. Um, but when you're trying to debug stuff inside your browser, uh, if your API is not returning JSON, it's like a huge hassle to do that. So I think, um, you know, right now we already, people are already building a lot of like Chrome DevTools extensions that deal with GraphQL. Um, but I think like this kind of fits into what I see as like a, a broader theme where um, when you're doing kind of more cutting edge stuff, the tools that are built into the browser to help you debug your code aren't always as helpful as they were before. Um, but I don't think it's a problem. It's just like, you know, the tooling is built for what most people are doing. Um, and then eventually, as more and more people are doing a certain thing, the browsers will want to have the tools that support that thing. Uh, yeah, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, the, the biggest thing I think would probably be just from a general data loading perspective and not related to GraphQL would be being able to more easily load data over like a more compact transport than JSON. What would that look what kind of what would that look like? What would be a more compact uh... Uh, I guess it would have to be a binary thing, right? Like I mean message pack is one example or protobuf. Um, one advantage that GraphQL has in particular is that you could compile your GraphQL queries into like a protobuf definition. Um, so that you can actually deserialize your results without having to also at the same time figure out what the structure is, because you can know the structure of the response ahead of time. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities there. But I think that's not currently blocking GraphQL adoption in any way. Um, it's just more like an opportunity of what could happen in the future. Cool. I think we are basically at time. So thank you, everybody, for joining. You can follow everybody on. On Twitter. We'll try to get everybody's Twitter. It's uh, Addy Osmo.
Kosmani, A-D-D-Y-O-S-M-A-N-I on Twitter. Brendan is Brendan Ike, B-R-E-N-D-A-N-E-I-C-H. Myself into. Uh, <laughs> Nolan is at Nolan Lawson, L-A-W-S-O-N. Sashko is at Stubilo, at S-T-U-B-A-I-L-O. Matt uh, Clay Potch is at Potch, it, at Potch. And then uh, Sean is at The Larkin. Uh, the Lark I N N, and you can follow Taras at Taras M on Twitter, and you can find me also uh, Tracy at Lady Leet. You know, definitely, I think encouraging everybody to continue the conversation on Twitter. Make sure that uh, as you guys are using browsers and tools and technologies, that you are speaking up and telling people problems so that we can continuously try to improve these different things and any last words anybody anybody want to talk about soap <laughs> soap's the best so <laughs> everyone loves soap <laughs> keep the architecture clean with soap <laughs> I always bet on webpack <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, that's right no, just feel free to reach out to any of us if you've got like ideas for the web platform or APIs or anything to be doing better. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. File our, bugs on browsers. Our, file bugs. That's good. Um, <laughs> our Dark Council meets ev uh, bi-monthly, so uh, we'll discuss any of your questions and decide whether you're worthy. <laughs> the Dark Council, also known as GitHub issues. <laughs> Also known as also known as like W three C. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining, and I will see you online. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Thank you.